Welcome to Health Matters, uh, Connecting with Nature. This week is the Mental Health Awareness Week uh, with focus on nature. And I am delighted that we'll be able to tell you about some of the initiatives that Oxford Health has for both protecting nature and uh, helping people to enjoy it. Um, you can join our conversation today uh, by posting your questions to the right hand side Q&A panel and we'll try to answer as many as we can in this event and address the rest uh, online in a follow up story. Um, our event is going to be recorded and it will be published on YouTube uh, shortly after the event. And now it is my pleasure to pass on to our trust chair, David Walker. I know that uh, this today's topic is very close to his heart. So on to you, David. Thank you very much, uh, Katerina, and thank you and to the comms team for making this event possible. And I have to say, Katerina, you've given us uh, a fantastically green uh, background. I take that to be maybe Finland, but um, maybe not, but it looks fantastic. Um, uh, as Katerina says, I'm the trust chair and uh, I've tried in a small way to push us a bit forward, but we're going to hear from people who are actually making the running in the trust uh, in a few minutes. Now, clearly there is a relationship, an indelible relationship between people's well-being and the well-being of the planet we inhabit. Our mental health in the widest sense depends upon the health of the ground, the land, the sky, the air that we, uh, that we live in. Uh, so, in a sense, being a mental health trust gives us a special obligation and opportunity to, to, to be more sustainable than we have been, recognising that it's an uphill struggle. We're going to hear about some of the challenges in a minute. Uh, this is Mental Health uh, Awareness Week, as Katrina said. Um, steps have been made. We have to recognise that there has been a movement in favour of recognising parity between physical health and mental health, but equally there is a long way to go. However, um, the COVID experience, I think, has given us a number of pointers, pointers both to how we might be a more effective deliverer of mental health services, pointers also, it will come up again today, as to how we might be a more sustainable uh, NHS organisation. One on the plus side of COVID, I think, has been a sense that there are ways in which we can transact our business. There are ways in which we can operate as an organisation that are more sustainable, less uh, cons le consuming less uh, carbon, consuming less fewer uh, unsustainable resources. Uh, we don't travel as much as we did. That has to be a good thing, while recognising that clearly there are a number of ways in which lacking face to face interactions perhaps also in a clinical context, does have some costs. Uh, this, as Katrina said, is a number of, uh, one of a number of events uh, under the Health Matters rubric, which uh, our membership team's organising. Um, members of the Trust are an important part of our community. They elect members of our Council of Governors, and indeed elections are taking place as we speak. Um, if you'd like to become more involved in any way, there is an opportunity. There are some data in the panel on the right hand side of your screen. And we do welcome uh, all uh, new members uh, of the trust. Uh, and if you are a member and you haven't voted uh, for membership of the Council of Governors, please avail yourself uh, of the opportunity. Now, we're going to hear today from uh, colleagues who are directly involved in our sustainability effort. Uh, John Upham, uh, our sustainability manager, uh, Katrina Miller, who in a sense represents clinical investment in sustainability, and Julie Pick, our head of char charity uh, and involvement. They're going to tell us about some of the initiatives going on within uh, uh, Oxford Health. Um, I just add, they will amplify this point in detail. We have no choice as a trust but to try and do more, to try and be more sustainable. Um, we reach out uh, into uh, society, economy, uh, into the natural environment, and we have a, a moral and, a, 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 as it were, a, an NHS obligation to think about our impact uh, on the planet uh, in terms of our capacity to be uh, an effective deliverer of better health. 
not just in terms of acute care, not just in terms of responding to those who come to us with need, but in trying to prevent people needing our services. One of the paradoxes of being a trust like ours is that the more we can do to stop people uh, lacking well-being, losing their uh, mental health in the widest sense, the more effective we are. And clearly that involves us with partners. And I was very proud to be able to sign on behalf of the Trust, uh, the Oxford City uh, Sustainability Initiative uh, recently. A long, long way to go, um, but it, small steps are uh, are welcome. Talking of steps, I'm now going to pass to John Upham, our Sustainability Manager, who will Tell us about some of the things that we're doing. Over to you, John. Thank you, David. And um, thank you for the opportunity to talk about nature and how it's aligned to the NHS sustainability strategy. My presentation is in three sections today. Um, firstly, benefits of nature. Uh, second, nature, the nature around us. And finally, looking at what's happening next. As a sustainability manager, I've been working on the environmental and sustainability policy now for a number of years, which has culminated in the, the Trust Green Plan. Next slide, please. In terms of benefits, um, there's been numerous research undertaken over a period of time on the benefits of nature um, to healthcare. Early research was conducted in the 80s by Professor Roger Ehrlich um, in an American hospital where 23 patients were assigned to rooms with windows looking out into nature and a, and a natural scene. These patients had a short stay in hospital and experienced lower levels of medical intervention than the 23 matching patients in rooms with windows facing a brick building wall. The Centre for Sustainable Healthcare continued with nature-based research and, part, uh, and partnered with the NHS Forest as part of a campaign to improve health and wellbeing of our of patients, staff, and by encouraging access to green space. Next slide, please. In terms of where we are, um, the Trust has got on the estate um, in excess of 800 trees. Um, in an area equivalent to 150 football pitches. Um, over 35 species of trees, of trees um, from beach through to you, um, providing welcome shelter from the rain and the sun, and also contributing to our carbon footprint in absorbing over 16 tonnes of carbon annually. To add to the tree assets, on Sustainability Day, the Trust Executive Team planted some additional trees across, across the county in Oxfordshire, Buckinghamshire and Wiltshire at the Whiteleaf Centre, Little Moor Warnford and, 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 and at Marlborough House in Swindon. Further areas of interest include the plant of a bumblebee border at the Whiteleaf Centre, but which contains a variety of flowers to include lavender, which has a wonderful scent and colour to attract bees. Next slide, please. So what's happening now? The Trust have developed a partnership with Earthwatch Europe, who undertake scientific research projects to help the environment. The plan is to plant tiny forests, a tiny forest at Littlemore, which comprises 600 trees planted in a tennis court sized plot. This promotes a rich diversity, attracting uh, of over 500 animal and plant species over a three year period, providing a nature rich rich, accessible green space to reconnect with nature. And finally, to finish all the research and findings around nature is reflected in the biodiversity in the delivery of the NHS net zero carbon plan, which refers to biodiversity and space and how carbon can be offset by trees. A final slide, please. And the final slide um, is really a personal reflection um, of my uh, my uh, walking during lockdown um, and my dog Percy. So and, and which had a huge benefit to both my um, personal well-being, mental health, uh, physical health in during that lockdown period when there's a lot of isolation. But just being able to be in the uh, to experience nature and be in the outside air um, was a, was a wonderful experience. And I'll hand back now to David.
Many thanks, John. Maybe just a word, brief word from you about whether you feel during COVID we have seen developments that can add to our capacity to be more sustainable. I mean, yes, particularly around um, during the, the lockdown period, um, our travel uh, reduced by 70%. So there's certainly so that obviously uh, contributes to the uh, low noise levels, um, lots of wildlife. I didn't mention the fox as well, which I did meet on, on the Warmford site. So the fact that we had um, it was such a quiet period and the urban foxes were starting to become um, more into the cities, um, lots more wildlife around just because um, not, not so many humans around, not so much traffic around. Um, and more more opportunity for for plant and fauna to um, to be within our in, in, on our estate. So yeah, lots of opportunities during that period. Great. Can I pass now to Katrina Miller, who, as I said earlier, represents the I hope commitment to, of our uh, clinicians and in their dealings uh, with patients, uh, trying to make what we do as a health trust more sustainable. Uh, you, you're based, are you not, Katrina, in Swindon? Uh, which uh, poses all sorts of issues different from Oxford in terms of its physical environment. But over to you. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Can you hear me OK? Mm. Thank you, David, and everyone for having me to talk. Um, yep, so I'm Katrina Meller, um, child and adolescent psychiatrist working in um, the inpatient, the adolescent inpatient environment. And this is a short talk today about the work we're doing in Marlborough House. So, yep, that's in Swindon. It's a 12 bed unit um, and our work is around how to weave nature based practice and thinking into tier four CAMS work. Um, and although that's my setting, I think a lot of what I'll speak about could be relevant to any clinical setting with a few tweaks. Um, and I think it's important to say at this point that the, there are different ways of doing this. Um, and I'm not speaking as an expert, but my hope is that by showcasing a few examples that we've tried, we can promote further conversation and inspiration. So um, about two years ago, we became convinced that this was something we needed to do. We could see that it makes sense on every level. Um, we all personally know what fresh air and beautiful places do for our mental health. Um, as John began to say, the science is becoming ever clearer that time in nature is associated with myriad benefits to human health and well-being. Um, this approach aligns with the work we're already doing at Marlborough House on healthy living and aligns with Oxford Health culture, with the Green Spaces framework um, and the charitable funding streams. Um, and I'm grateful for all of these factors working in our favour. Even so, maybe as with any change, it's still been quite difficult to get things off the ground. Um, and of course, there have been major hurdles thrown our way by the pandemic. However, we've made some great progress um, and I hope to share that with you now. Um, so if we uh, go back to Marlborough House just over a couple of years ago, we um, wondered where to start, didn't exactly know, so we just started small. Um, initially, it was about reaching out to other people, so to relevant networks, asking loads and loads of questions um, to loads and loads of different people about nature-friendly healthcare in general. Then uh, we started holding regular staff and young people meetings at Marlborough House, and through that set monthly goals together. These were just small tasks, but each month we worked together and through this we uh, reduced our waste, we improved our recycling and we increased the biodiversity in the garden by planting trees and flowers. Um, and things just developed from there. So this got us thinking more about the environment around each of us and how important that is to our health and well-being. We work with Artscape um, to improve the inside of the building. There's an example in the top left hand side of this slide um, and continue to work with them. The young people often choose nature themes to incorporate into their design. So that idea of bringing the outdoors in. Then we brought walks to local parks and green spaces into the daily programme and into unit trips. Some of us started doing our sessions outdoors, our normal one to one sessions outdoors. And we began to get an appreciation for how the types of spaces and the nature of the land affects interactions. The young people relate to each other 
and to staff differently outdoors, it changes things. And that, of course, is what part of what we're looking for in our care, the difference that makes a difference. The next step in this set of work is to introduce going on wilder walks. So somewhere like this, the photo at the bottom of this slide. And our question is, how would it be for us to be at a greater distance from the unit, out in the wind and the weather, exposed to these bigger views? Unfortunately, the first of our wild walks was planned on Friday the 8th of January this year. Um, it's just before lockdown. We've had another couple of false starts, but we're due to try again this Friday. So wish us luck. Next slide, please. Um, so if um, sort of parallel to this, if we go back in time again, um, another project was growing. Um, through our monthly goal setting and activity, there was now a core group of us. And I think that's really important, finding other like minded folk. We were flying the nature flag and, and we had great support from um, from the consultants on the ward, particularly Gillian uh, Combe, also Dick, and from the senior nurse managers, Lorna and Tom. We heard about a brilliant project, Families in the Wild, in the Riverside Unit in Bristol and completely were inspired by their stories of transformation. And at the same time, we met and visited Wiltshire Wildlife Trust in their absolutely stunning setting of Lower Moor Farm Nature Reserve, which is near Swindon and is in the background of this slide. So we began to plan our own Marlborough House Families in the Wild intervention. Uh, so the intervention is two days uh, every Easter and summer holiday for young people and their families to do bushcraft and forest school type activities together. Some of them are pictured here, supported by both staff from Marlborough House and also staff from the Wildlife Trust. The benefits we'd heard from the Riverside project um, include helping young people manage their own risk, um, enhanced family cohesiveness and improved therapeutic relationships. It also helps families to think of other ways they can be outdoors together in the future. And um, so our first step was to run a multidisciplinary staff day, a pilot day in early March 2020. I think you can probably guess what happens next um, to test run the activities so that we could all then, all the staff that had been, could then feed into further risk and contingency planning before the actual families day. Plus, it would increase the staff's confidence to be there doing these activities. And um, that went well, but what we didn't expect was such an overwhelmingly positive response from the staff who went about their own experience of having been there for the day. And not all of them thought of themselves as particularly out, outdoor types. Um, and this has definitely been a theme that we've noticed. The intention behind setting up and thinking about these interventions has been to improve the young person experience and outcomes but the benefits to the staff involved are undeniable um, it's exciting it's motivating it's restorative and it's team building so after the staff pilot day uh, we were set to go the first family dates were booked for april 2020 but of course covid cancelled that then we tried for july 2020 and then October 2020, and then April 2021. None have been possible so far, but the goodwill remains and we're really determined to make it happen. So July 2021, it is, we hope. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, so the third and final sort of parallel project that we've been thinking about um, over the last few months. So this is a bit more recently what we have been able to do in COVID times. Um, a team of 10 of us have done nature connectedness training. And this is a course run by an organisation local to Bristol called the Natural Academy. The training is outdoors as much as possible, although through COVID we had a slightly strange situation where we were doing nature training on Zoom. Um, it introduces some eco psychology principles to us and also provides really practical resources on how to support others to feel more connected to nature. And there's a rapidly expanding evidence base around this concept of nature connectedness and many tried and tested delightful nature activities that have been shown to enhance it. So this is the idea. It's not just about being in an outdoor space. It's about feeling um, in a in a relation in an emotional connection to the space and the land um, that you're in. And the training guides us to think about how to implement these ideas flexibly um, in our own setting. Next slide, please. 
So uh, we're working closely with Oxford Healthcare Improvement Centre to evaluate all of our work. The evaluation is ongoing, uh, but for now we're gathering and sharing quotes because they just flow out of people at the end of days like these. And I've just written a few here, one from staff, one from a young person on the unit and one from uh, one of the Riverside young people doing families in the wild. But there's there's another 50 for each of these. Um, I think you can sense and see that we've found this work a source of joy and fun, which um, has been so needed in the last few months, particularly. Uh, final slide, please. Um, so in summary, doing things differently is hard, um, especially when we're all managing demanding caseloads. Um, there are really important issues to consider, such as confidentiality, consent, risk assessment and staff confidence and capacity. However, um, what we're seeing is that with careful planning to make sure the interventions are safe and inclusive, these approaches promote staff well-being and team building, as well as improving patient experience. Um, and this slide is just to acknowledge um, some of the many wonderful people and organisations that have inspired and or um, support the work that we do at Marlborough House. Uh, thank you. Back to you, David. Thank you very much, uh, Katrina. You used an interesting word a moment ago, restorative. I mean, as you said, you and your colleagues are under tremendous pressure as clinicians. Are there ways in which participation in sustainability initiatives can help people get by in, in, in these difficulties? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, in, in different um, ways, I think sometimes um, the, the emotional toll on us is is to do with the anxiety and stress of um, of the climate crisis. And I think just taking action of any type, as long as you're looking after yourself as well, can help you manage that. But I think there's something really particularly restorative about uh, these nature based solutions um, that, that, you know, not only are you doing something um, that's helping the bigger picture, but it's so important on a personal and on, in a social uh, basis, it, 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 it's like we're made to be in that environment and, and we feel more relaxed, calmer, we interact differently with people. Um, and, and it's one of those things that's really hard. Well, I think we all know it, but it's hard to believe how good it is until you've actually been outdoors with a group of people from work and, and experienced, um, you know, the smiles on people's faces, the, the change in energy, the, the fact that we did that pilot day just before lockdown. So we all have these beautiful memories of this sort of shiny day together in the woodland by the lake and it really carried us through um so so yeah i think on many many levels um this work can can be really restorative as well as challenging and, and difficult thank you very much can i hand over now to julie pink who is our head of charity and involvement julie hello and thank you for having me today it's uh, it's really lovely to be here um, and as the head of charity and involvement, I'm really happy to be talking to you about um, our Green Spaces Appeal, which is um, something that we have in place in the charity and was one of our earliest appeals um, and is here really to support Oxford Health uh, NHS Foundation Trust, making the most of its green spaces and uh, the spaces that those that are provided for patients and carers and staff. Um, one of the first things that um, I'd like to do is show you one of our success stories from the last year. Um, it has been really difficult to do things um, through the pandemic uh, as it has been for, for everyone. Um, and it was uh, such a proud moment for us to be able to actually deliver um, a new garden space for staff and patients and their carers and families um, at Abingdon Community Hospital. Um, and uh, if we can play our video explaining how that happened um, right now, that would be grand.
Do we have a, a sound sound issue? I believe we may. Um, I think uh, if I, I leave the technical side to deal with that. I'll, I'll talk about some other things and maybe we can come back to uh, the video when the sound side has been resolved. Anish, Anish if you unmuted, would that help? I don't know. No. Uh, OK, uh, well, we may have to just show a link to that video It is on YouTube um, and uh, it's, it's quite a nice video just explaining how the garden was developed. Um, so if I have a quick chat about some of the other things that we've been doing through the charity. Uh, our charity is here to support and enhance the experience of patients within the trust and Green Spaces is a really big part of that. Uh, we've been really happy to be involved with different projects, some of them suggested by patients themselves as part of patient groups, some of them raised by staff members um, and others raised by carers and governors um, and volunteers uh, joining the trust. Um, the charity can support projects which are big and small, so it can range from you know, just providing those seeds and those plants to, to enhance a space all the way through to actually developing a garden um, like we have done here in Abingdon. Um, and those gardens make such a difference to staff and to patients. Um, we get a lot of feedback from people talking about how they're using the spaces and also what, what difference that makes to their recovery journeys. And, and we're really proud to be part of that. Um, part of keeping these gardens um, beautiful and lovely and maintaining uh, the work of the charity um, is our volunteering and uh, we're really happy to work with volunteers across most of our sites um, who come in and help continue to make those gardens beautiful. So that might be doing the awful jobs of uh, weeding and pruning, but they all have to happen. Or it might be actually coming and, and doing some painting or planting, uh, working with our patients um, in some cases to kind of really change those spaces. Um, and I know I've seen some lovely images from Marlborough House Swindon um, of planting and of painted stones, which have kind of brought some colour to the garden, even when it's winter and, and things look a bit um, less colourful than they do now. Uh, we're also part of the uh, Oxford Health Green Spaces group and we work with estates and with clinicians across the trust to identify projects and to bring those projects to life. Um, and we couldn't do it without the support of uh, the trust and the support of our donors as well. Um, so we are immensely grateful for all that support um, and uh, I think we will try and give the uh, the video one more go, I believe, uh, and then um, we'll pop up something just to let you know about our appeal and how you can find out more about getting involved with us. This project started about a year ago when we worked with some of the staff here to start designing the garden for the project. The main aim is to improve it for both the staff and the patients and for wildlife here. So with this place becomes a buzzing place both for people and wildlife. The charity are really keen to support projects like this because it just shows how much we can change the environment to enhance the experience that people have coming here to Abingdon Hospital. I love our Chilton Rangers projects because we've drawn a huge community of people to work together. It's not just a contractor coming in and doing stuff and it magically happening. So we've got all ages working from young people to families to local Abingdon people. Today I've been painting everything black for the pergola and also the plant for the plants. It feels really good to, to give back to the NHS and the staff here. Everyone is working together and you get to actually see it actually become something. It's like you get to see something in real time and that you know the people are going to appreciate and be able to use and it's going to be helpful and for all these people who are working incredibly hard in really horrific times basically. I am absolutely delighted it looks amazing and I just think it is really 
deserving um, for our staff and our staff will be delighted. It's just somewhere really special and it's transformed a piece of scrubland into something really quite outstandingly uh, beautiful. I think it will help staff and patients a lot. It's going to provide a nice space to be in, which is especially needed at this kind of time. It's going to provide a wonderful kind of therapeutic atmosphere for people to come and explore during those uh, little breaks that we have when we get them. Thank you. That, that is just a really good example of, of how we can bring people together and really make a difference in, in quite a small um, space and uh, a great way of, of getting everybody involved, really. And um, as Katrina has, uh, has alluded to, um, just being out there together, um, doing something, painting, planting, uh, building things, it, it made such a difference to all of the volunteers and the staff who were part of that day um, at the end of last summer. Um, and, you know, I definitely walked away from that day feeling like I'd achieved something which was absolutely brilliant and, uh, and something that we want to make everybody across the trust feel as well. Um, so if you do want to get involved, this is our, um, our link here. Um, you can get in touch with us. The Green Spaces Appeal is live at the moment and uh, we're always happy to hear from people who want to get involved. So uh, yeah, please do get in touch and I'll hand back to David. That's fantastic, Julie. Thanks very much. And I'm glad we had the chance to see that video. It was very, very um, enthusiasm is just infectious. Great. Now, uh, Katrina, you're going to um, moderate um, any questions that um, uh, people on the call may have. Uh, so uh, over to you. Thank you, David. We don't actually have that many questions, but uh, we have a big one here, which is uh, it's actually come uh, in advance of this event from our audience, which is uh, have you come across climate anxiety in your work? and how can we alleviate it? And I think uh, maybe I'll first pass this on to Katriona. Have you come across climate anxiety um, amongst the people that you work with? Hi there, I didn't hear the second part of the question. Have we come across it and how, how do we? Um, the climate anxiety and uh, how we could alleviate it. Alleviate it, okay, yeah. Um, thank you. Um, yes, I have come across climate anxiety. Um, one of the other hats I wear is um, working with the Royal College of Psychiatrists, um, initially on their sustainability committee, but um, I've also since then um, started a group um, within the child and adolescent faculty. Uh, it's called EcoCams and, and we're responding to various issues um, that are relevant to young people at this time of eco and, and nature crisis. And so, yeah, of course, eco-anxiety um, has has been something that we've, we've thought about a lot. Um, and in fact, if people are interested, I drew up um, a, a leaflet with help from some colleagues within um, our faculty and others and other um, colleagues as uh, psychology and psychotherapy colleagues um, called eco distress. So um, we, we chose to call it eco distress rather than anxiety in a bid to try and um, not pathologize this response um, because it's something that we see as um, a, a sensical um, response um, to a really real threat that um, particularly young people seem to be able to see very clearly. Um, and, you know, we sort of say it's it's healthy to be frightened in a crisis. Um, the question is what to do about it, isn't it? How, how to uh, validate that experience that is really, um, that, that varies. It can be all sorts of different feelings. And that was another reason we talked about distress rather than anxiety, because it's not just anxiety and fear. It's all sorts of things. Um, all sorts of things are a natural response to the future that young people in particular are facing at the moment. Um, so the, the leaflet that we produced was um, was just a starting point, but was trying to talk um, through those steps. First of all, it, it's a sort of coming to terms with process, actually. So first of all, listening, um, acknowledging, validating um, and accepting that um, if people look 
straight on at these, this crisis and don't turn away. They will feel fear and panic and anxiety, um, maybe anger, guilt, shame, also all sorts of things. And of course, everybody's different. They might feel that to a different differing degree, but that all makes sense um, when we look at what's happening to the, the beautiful land around us, um, to peoples across the world. This is a really unfair um, crisis that exacerbates inequalities when we look at a species that we've grown up with uh, loving. So it's. It, I think that was our first message was to, ex you know, validate and then we talk through different um different ways to balance the self-care so that um helping people feel um some level of support and um, soothing and um helping people make connections with other um other folk who feel the same or or nature or whatever makes that gives them a sense of joy and um meaning at the same time as giving some advice on taking action um, and that doesn't need to be taking to the streets although some people find that helpful um, it can range from anything from from uh, planting and, and rejuvenating wildlife to things that maybe take a slightly more political stance um, but all the time emphasizing that although taking action is important this is a kind of collective responsibility um, the individuals there's nothing wrong with these individuals um, that this isn't an illness or a disorder this is a, a rational response um, but there are ways we can help people cope with it but ultimately our eyes should be on the cause which is the climate and nature crisis and and that's sort of a, a whole other aspect of the work that I know Oxford Health is doing but also that we're doing as a Royal College we published a statement uh, declaring a climate emergency last week and um, you, that's the important thing to keep the eye on on that as being um, what needs to happen. Thank you, Katriona, for your very comprehensive um, uh, reply. Um, we also have another one here, which I still think might be for you. Um, how can we encourage our outpatients to connect with, to nature? Uh, does Oxford Health run any nature groups for outpatients? And if if you are not able to answer this, uh, maybe David can pick it up. Yeah, no, I, I, I can start, but yeah, maybe then pass on to David. Um, so like I said, I think a lot of what we're talking about could be done wherever you work. So bringing nature indoors, bringing uh, even pot plants behind into the consulting room, bringing those sort of questions into your talking with with young people like asking questions about special places special animals um just having it in your thinking maybe maybe thinking about what nature providers there are uh, locally there's a lot of um expertise about um well-being in nature from outside the nhs and people are really looking to collaborate with us um one of the people on our Nature Connected training was a member of the community team um, here in Swindon. And so we're going to work with her to try and develop some of these ideas more into the community setting. Um, but, but yeah, there is a, there's, a, there's a lot that could be done. Thank you very much. I also had um, a note coming in from John who wanted to talk about our green champions. Uh, did you want to come in now, John, at this point? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, just to follow on from the from the, the comments that uh, Katrina was talking about, um, we, as part of the um, NHS and the, the Trust Green Plan and staff engagement, we have produced a, a Green Champions Handbook. And now as part of that roadmap to zero carbon, uh, we'll be in the process of, of launching that in the coming months. And just really to embed as part of sustainability and, and embedding it within the organisation and just having a number of volunteers within each directorate uh, throughout the organisation and just people that have got interest in, in nature, sustainability and, and being able to, to talk to their colleagues and, and if, even if it's just small things like turning, on, turning off a light or bringing in plants. Um, there's a variety of things that, that um, the staff that our staff and colleagues can assist in in our in our progress towards a zero carbon so that's something that I'll be launching uh, and I'll be looking towards um, all the directorates and all the staff for, for, for support in this matter certainly around volunteers thank you thank you John and I think we have uh, 
time for our final question, which is, um, it says, it is wonderful to hear what you are doing to make the abundance of natural spaces in Oxford part of your healing. I am worried about the large amount of land on NHS sites allocated for development on the local plan. Um, what are your thoughts about this and how can these potential harms be avoided or reduced? I wonder if you, John, and then maybe David uh, could address this. <laughs> It's quite a challenging question. Yeah, I mean that's a that is that's quite a, a challenging question because obviously the you know, the NHS is in a position where it has a, a you know a, a large estate, but they obviously they'd be looking for acquisitions and disposals over the coming period. But part of any um, development program will include green space, uh, and as part of any planning development, certainly uh, in Oxfordshire, you've got to uh, have a, a robust green plan whether that's a part of the travel plan as well, but certainly a robust travel um, uh, green plan before you uh, get to that next stage of planning. So that would have to go through all the planning process and part of that would obviously we, would be um, encouraging nature in that in that planning process. Okay. Now, if I might just add to that, give you one example. We treat patients at the Warnford Hospital in a building which is nearly 200 years old that really isn't acceptable not just for the patients but for the planet that building cannot be insulated it cannot be brought up to standards that are common now uh, in our world we have to have a new hospital my commitment as chair of the trust is that that new hospital will be zero carbon that new hospital will be as not just sustainable but will also picking up on what Katrina said we'll try and build into the therapeutic environment of our patients outlooks on the green space that we're thank that we thankfully have uh, with the Warnford Meadow and and make make it a, gr a green hospital while recycling the buildings uh, uh, for new use because it, 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 at present they simply aren't acceptable there has to be in other words new development but our commitment is to make that new development as sustainable as possible Thank you, David. And I think we are coming uh, close to the end of the event. So I wonder if you have any closing remarks um, apart from what you just said. Um, I th thank you again and your colleagues. Uh, thank all the contributors today. Um, Katrina used the words anger, guilt, shame, and many of us feel that uh, about the state uh, of the world in which we live, how we're treating our planet. But we've heard today positive ways in which that sense can be translated into action. Um, even the most, John alluded to this, even sm small scale things that we can all do, leaving aside um, the big targets, which as a trust we, we need to impose upon ourselves. Uh, Katrina, again, if I can cite you, you used the word joy. Uh, and I think if we can get a sense that being a more sustainable, being a more environmentally conscious, being a greener organisation can bring meaning both to clinical colleagues, but particularly to our patients and service users. And in a sense, if we can help this planet recover, we can help recovery of people in the widest sense. So thank you all very much today for what I found a, an utterly fascinating conversation. Uh, Katrina, anything else? No, I think that sums it up. Thank very you very good. much for everybody joining us today. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you.